Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's maybe 25 years ago since I last visited Singapore, so it's an honor to be back. And as you heard, I work at Imperial College in London. Of course, many of you will know as they're involved in running a, a medical course out here. But I thought I would introduce just to show you where I am back home. So Imperial College uh, HQ is based in South Kensington. I now work on the intensive care unit at St. Mary's Hospital as part of the Imperial Group, which is based in Paddington. Prior to that, I'd worked uh, in its sister hospital, a Charing Cross Hospital, which, just to give you some geography, is not in Charing Cross. For those of you who know London, it moved. It's in Hammersmith. And then the third hospital within our group is called the Hammersmith Hospital, which, of course, can't be in Hammersmith because Charing Cross is already there, and that's actually in East Acton. So it's slightly confusing how we've named our hospitals as part of the Imperial Group. But you can see where they are scattered around West London. But I thought I'd show another building uh, that, again, hopefully you might recognize, Buckingham Palace, which is just around the corner. I mention it because, of course, today there's a small wedding going on in the UK. Um, they obviously knew I was speaking here because my invite, uh, they decided not to um, send it to me. It never arrived because they knew I had other commitments. So uh, it's an honor uh, to, be, to be here uh, today. I'll just put my disclosures and acknowledgments up. And like Michael, actually, it's the academic uh, disclosures probably I should uh, mention. A lot of my work is funded by the UK NIHR. Um, and they have a disclaimer um, that they like me to specify that the views expressed are mine, not necessarily the uh, NHS or the Department of Health in the UK. So I'm going to talk about personalized medicine. And first of all, so why do we need it? Well, I think we're all aware that what we generally treat in intensive care, whether it be sepsis or ARDS, is very heterogeneous syndromes. Um, and what we do is pretend everybody's the same because they have some commonalities in their um, symptoms and signs, and we give them a treatment, all of them the same treatment, and we hope that overall some will benefit, accepting that we know that some won't or some may even be harmed. But can we do more than that? Can we actually identify those patients who are actually going to benefit? Because what we want to do is take this group of patients and actually break them down into more homogeneous groups and maybe risk stratify. Or what I will come to is actually, I think, more, it's more than just stratification. It's personalizing our treatment. So we can identify those who may be inflamed who need anti-inflammatory therapies. But actually, maybe many of our patients need immune stimulation, in fact, we're learning. Or maybe many patients are doing just fine with our current therapies, and we just need to continue what we currently do. And I think we acknowledge this, and even the new sepsis-3 definitions accept that. It's taken away the idea that it's all about inflammation, and it talks about a dysregulated host response. So it's not just inflammation, there's more to it. And we recognize in the shock definitions that there are cellular and metabolic changes that are important. And again, they went a little bit in sort of risk stratifying. It's shock is not just hypotension or the need for vasopressors. With the use of a lactate as a sort of measure of um, metabolism and so on, to risk stratify a higher risk uh, group of patients. But I'll show you, I think we can do more than just measuring lactate, uh, and this is the way we need to go in the future. So, what should we measure? Well, we could measure anything. And what I'm going to do in this talk is just use some examples. Uh, I can't mention everything, but go through the system from the, uh, right from the DNA right through to metabolic profiles and examples of how we might be able to use uh, these measures if we're going to personalize our treatment. So I'll start with genomics. We know we're all different, and we, it's obvious that we may behave differently to different treatments. And one of the talks, um, the first talk was all about cardiovascular management. And if we think around pharmacogenomics of our catecholamines, commonly used for sepsis and other treatments in ICU, if you look in the cardiac literature, there's quite a lot about genetic polymorphisms here with the beta-2 receptor, showing that they determine vascular reactivity and desensitization varies according to the polymorphisms you might have. So the polymorphisms, these common variations that uh, will be present in different um, variations within the normal population. But there's other receptors in the beta-1 uh, polymorphism, again, affecting catecholamine response, and even within the alpha receptor, 
uh, insertion deletion polymorphism associated with sudden uh, cardiac death. So again, you can see how this all might be relevant for us in intensive care. But that's more in the cardiac literature. What's been done in the critical care literature? Well, starting in the operating theater, this study looking at um, obstetric patients having spinal anesthesia. And according to the genotype of that beta-2 receptor, you can see that there was different amounts of hypotension and therefore how much vasopressor load they required to maintain blood pressure after uh, receiving uh, a spinal anesthetic. So it does seem that people are starting to look at this in our more critical care areas. And the group that have done most of this work up and to date uh, is Jim Russell and Keith Wally, based in Vancouver, where I worked a number of years ago. And they've taken uh, patients, uh, and this is two cohorts, an observational study at St. Paul's Hospital where they work, and then the VAST trial that you'll be familiar with. And they looked at patients according to um, what they call a tag snip for the beta-2 receptor. So rather than measuring the whole haplotype, the whole combination, as in the previous study, they looked at one polymorphism. And they see here the, the AA homozygotes, where in both of these independent cohorts was associated uh, with a worse outcome. OK, so that's association. More importantly, was though then when they looked at treatment. And on the left here is the patients who weren't given steroids. And on the right, the patients were given steroids. You notice that when they were given the steroids, this difference in mortality seems to disappear with the genotype. Now, there's a couple of caveats. These are not randomized controlled trials. Um, and so these were where the, the physicians chose to give them steroids. And also in this AA genotype, it's very low numbers, even in single figure. So I think we should be very cautious in how we over in, not to overinterpret it. But it is encouraging, and more importantly, that they've also shown functional correlates. We know the polymorphisms have been shown in other studies to be functional. But here in these patients, those who had that AA genotype had a higher heart rate. They used more epinef norepinephrine to maintain the blood pressure. And importantly, when they took the cells from the, this genotype, they also had reduced anti-inflammatory uh, re responses. And so you can see that these were at least a rationale. There's a biological rationale why they may benefit more from giving steroids to this particular group of patients. They've carried on looking at other uh, polymorphisms within uh, the sort of vasopressor, vasopressor pathways. They've looked at ones here uh, in the LMPEP, the enzymes that break down vasopressin, and again shown polymorphisms that associate uh, with increased mortality, and also those that may be associated with rates of serious adverse events, both with vasopressin and with norepinephrine. And so I think this is the sort of areas where we may take it forward that not all our patients will behave uh, similarly with our drugs. They may have different side effect profiles, and we probably should be considering this in the future. I think we do need more evidence, and this is work we're currently un uh, undertaking with the NIHR funding that I mentioned at the beginning in two of the trials that run, Vanish and the Leopards trial, which I'll be talking about uh, later on this afternoon. So it's a little bit about genetics. Now, I've put, obviously, in sepsis, there is an, uh, the host side, but there is also the environment, particularly the bugs that have caused the sepsis. Now, I'm not going to give a long talk about bacteria, but just point out that I don't think we should count all infections the same. They do seem to be differences, including how we respond to them. So this is the Genocep uh, study, a European-wide, uh, genome-wide association study that was part of. And it recruited two main groups of patients those who had community-acquired pneumonia and those who had fecal peritonitis. And when we did this genome-wide association study, which you can see here on what we call a Manhattan plot, so each of the dots rec represent a different polymorphism that's been typed in this genome-wide study, uh, going along the chromosomes on the x-axis there. And the y-axis is showing the uh, minus log of the p-value. So basically, the smaller it is, the more significant. And generally, you need 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 uh, is considered significant for genome-wide association studies. You lump everybody together, bigger numbers, you don't get any clear signal coming out of any polymorphism associated with outcome. But when we looked at the two different types of infections, specifically, and this is community-acquired pneumonia, actually we did start to see a significant hit. And this is in chromosome 5 here, you see shown in red, where there was an association between a polymorphism and outcome but only in the pneumonia patients. And this was in the fur gene. And here, importantly, the uh, Manhattan plot is shown, is shown in the top, the discovery cohort. But we were able to look for external validation in other cohorts. So in the vast uh, data, uh, Eli Lilly shared with us the placebo group from the, uh, the Prowess study. 
And then by the time we came to finishing all this analysis, we'd recruited more patients into the UK uh, GAIN study. And you could see that there's a fairly consistent signal that this polymorphism, the C allele particularly, is associated with protection, seems to uh, lower mortality in patients having pneumonia. Now, this gene is involved, uh, involved in neutrophil chemotaxis. So maybe there are groups of patients who already have a better outcome, and maybe it's actually putting up an idea for potential therapeutic targets in patients with pneumonia. But we didn't see the same thing in the peritonitis patient. So it is important to think about the uh, pathogen or the site of infection, perhaps. So that's at the top layer. What about the transcriptomics work, looking at RNA? And I think this is where some of the most exciting work is currently at the moment. And it's been involved in this working with my colleague, Julian Knight, uh, who's based in Oxford. And we took patients in the UK GAIN study, Genomic Advances in Sepsis, and it's part of the Genocept group. And we looked at the patients who, first of all, we had took the community-acquired pneumonia patients. And we've done genome-wide transcriptomic analysis, so looking at the, uh, their uh, gene expressions across the whole genome. And we've done what we've called an unsupervised hierarchical cluster analysis. So we're looking for the, how the patients cluster together. And I've underlined it's unsupervised. And what I mean by that is that we don't put in any information, clinical information, about the patients. It's not who lived or died. It's just looking at the gene expression profiles and looking, do they cluster together? Uh, you know, similar profiles, and it does. There's essentially two big clusters uh, that come out. There may be others, but certainly two that we've called SRS, sepsis response signatures one and two. And you can see um, here with the principal component analysis how they're sort of clustering together. The gene expression profiles look similar in these two groups. And you can look at see um, how these gene expressions vary. This is what we call a volcano plot. And you can set levels of significance or a false discovery rate. And so where we set it here, there were 3,000 genes that differentially expressed between these two uh, sepsis response signatures, as we called them. And interestingly, it wasn't around inflammation, particularly not the inflammatory cytokines, but it was much more around uh, the immune phenotype, the immune suppression. And in fact, this SRS1 group was an immune suppressed phenotype with reduced T cell activation, with cell death, apoptosis, and so on. So that's right, there are 3,000 genes differentially expressed between these two patients. If this is going to be used clinically, we're never going to be able to measure 3,000 genes. This is a research tool that looking at the whole genome array. But importantly, you can identify patients into this SRS1 and 2 groups using a seven gene set. So again, you use computer algorithms to help identify which were the uh, biggest markers. And you can see there was a very low misclassification rate by actually just using seven genes. And importantly, what we found with this natural grouping of the data was how these patients did, what were their outcome like. So the SRS1 is shown in blue. In the original derivation cohort, um, you can see the SRS1, the immune suppressed phenotype, had a slightly worse outcome. By the time, again, we'd finished, we'd recruited more patients, and we had in our validation cohort, and we were seeing the same, uh, the same signatures were existing, and again, were associated with the same worse outcome in that SRS2 group. So, okay, that's interesting. These patients behaving differently on their gene expression profiles. Do they look different? Well, to, they're the same age, same sex. They have the same Apache 2 scores when we try to look at them. There are some differences that do seem to be more organ failure and particularly more shock present in that SRS1 phenotype. So we think, all right, well, do we need gene expression to differentiate them? Could we do it clinically? Well, we tried that using Apache score. You see, we weren't very good at classifying them into one group or the other. SOFA score did a little bit better, but still a third of the time we were misclassifying the patient. So it's not just illness severity. Could we learn new clinical variables? So we take them from the discovery cohort, looked at those variables associated with the worst outcome. But again, it's still 20% of the time we were misclassifying patients in the validation cohort. So it doesn't seem to work. It's more than just a clinical differentiator. The other thing I think that was important and goes back to that unsupervised analysis was that we tried to select genes afterwards based on mortality. Could we see those genes that were associated with uh, mortality? And obviously, in the model where we discovered it, it does quite well. I mean, you would hope it did. It selected the genes um, that we were associated with mortality in that first cohort. But when we then took them forward into the validation cohort, they don't validate. They're not the same. And I think this probably reflects the fact that there are many reasons why you die uh, because of sepsis. 
and it may be underlying conditions which may have very little representation in the gene expression. And so I think that this is the strength of these type of analysis is taking the unsupervised, looking for the natural groupings within the data. So that was the community-acquired pneumonia. We went on then to look at the fecal peritonitis patients, which as I mentioned earlier was the other half of this cohort. And we saw very similar things again. Starting afresh, doing an unsupervised hierarchical cluster analysis, we found these same SRS1 and SRS2 uh, phenotypes. And again, in this fecal peritonitis cohort that has a lower mortality overall, but again, it was the SRS1 uh, patients who had the worst outcome. And these two SRS groupings, very similar. It's the same sets of genes, maybe to slightly different levels, but you could see the same uh, immune-suppressed phenotype that was characterizing the SRS1 group. If you look at it another way in these Venn diagrams, you can see most of the genes differentially expressed in this type of sepsis. It didn't seem to matter what was the etiology of sepsis. There were some genes, more genes uh, up and down regulated in FP, uh, fecal peritonitis alone, and a few in the community acquired pneumonia, often around interferon, which suggesting maybe there was some viral activation um, you know, involved in the pneumonic processes. But there's a lot of shared uh, responses between these two etiologies of sepsis here. So that's just showing some of the work, and I'll come back to that bit, transcriptomics, at the end. What about at the next layer, looking at proteins? If you translate those into now the proteins, can you differentiate people? Well, again, people have been doing this. This is Jim Russell and Keith Wally, again from Vancouver, took the VAS cohort and measured a whole array of cytokines, a multiplex assay, and looked for those that were uh, patients who were particularly inflammatory. Had, um, they set a threshold and put patients who were either above or below that threshold. And then they looked at how they did with steroids. Again, not randomized, but they did a matching analysis to try and match patients, but it isn't randomized, of course. And the solid lines here on these survival curves show the patients uh, who were above that threshold, so they had high cytokine levels. And if they were in red, where they weren't given steroids, you see they have the worst outcome. But when they were given steroids, you see mortality was reduced. The dotted lines show the patients who had the low cytokine levels, and this way the curves are the other way around. So actually, without steroids, the patients did quite well. They weren't so inflammatory. But when they were given steroids, they actually had a worse outcome. So again, maybe we shouldn't be giving steroids uh, to everybody. We should be only giving them to select patients. Maybe on their inflammatory profiles is one way. And this fits with the same sort of work that's being done by the ArdsNet group uh, in America, led by Carolyn Calfee, who has taken, again, blood markers, protein markers, and clinical variables and found, again, in two independent cohorts, so they're seeing the same validation, these two phenotypes. They're called phenotype one and two. And uh, phenotype two here in these two trials associated with the worst outcome. And then importantly, there does seem to be an interaction with the treatment response. So this was in their PEEP trial, the different levels of PEEP. And you can see the mortality, if you're in the phenotype one, it was doing quite well with a higher PEEP, you did worse. But it was the phenotype two patients uh, who seem to get the benefit uh, from receiving the increased uh, PEEP. They've carried on and looked at it in other trials, and this was in the uh, FAT trial, the fluid uh, trial, where they give different amounts of fluid, conservative and liberal. And again, they differentiated these patients, and the uh, SRS, uh, sorry, not SRS, the subphenotype 2, is associated with more inflammation. And again, there was a treatment response. If you weren't in particularly inflamed, so in phenotype 1, you did better with more fluid, if you were more inflamed, you did worse with the extra fluid. Maybe more fluid is leaking out. But suggesting our patients aren't all the same and that we need to titrate our therapy accordingly to, uh, to the patient's requirements. So I think there's interesting work looking at the RNA and the proteomics, and I'm sure we'll be using that very soon. But one of the things is that all of that measurement is measuring what's in the circulation, in the plasma or the serum. But what's going on at the tissue level? So are we measuring the right compartment? Also, of course, our treatments come in at all of these different levels. How do they affect uh, these signatures? How do we respond to it? So many people have suggested that we should go down and measure the metabolic profiles, the final downstream marker, and then we can capture all of the aspects of what's gone on uh, before that. And I think it's an exciting area. This is something we've been working on at Imperial. It's a theme of ours. Um, and basically, the two main techniques that we use for this, either NMR or mass spec. So they each give you this big array, picking up these small metabolic um, profiles that you can see 
either with the chemical shift, how the molecules have spun around in the magnet in the NMR, or the mass to charge ratio uh, in the mass spec. And you can pick out the different uh, metabolites. And this is work we've been doing, uh, led by David Ancliffe, who's one of my uh, post-PhD students now. And we did just a small proof of concept um, study looking to see whether this could help us in the diagnosis of pneumonia. So what we did was he enrolled patients who were going to be ventilated in the ICU for 48 hours, and those who definitely had pneumonia on admission, so that the clinical opinion was they had pneumonia, and we used the scoring system to be sure that they really had pneumonia. And he really took patients who were ventilated who we were pretty damn sure they didn't have pneumonia, so they were brain-injured patients, subarachnoid hemorrhage, strokes, and so on. And it, we followed them on a daily basis and see whether they developed VAP or not. So the first comparison we did was to look at the brain injured versus the pneumonia patients. And we've again done these uh, principal component analysis and um, partial least squares. To, can we build a model that differentiates based on these metabolic profiles? And we could. You can see here they separate quite nicely, um, saying that the metabolic profiles are difference between these two groups of patients. And you can go back to the arrays and look at what metabolites are either differentially expressed here. So you can see in the brain injured patients, there were lots of phospholipids and lipids that we were detecting in their, in their serum. And you could then work out which um, metabolites you might want to measure to differentiate these patients. Well, I would put to you that's not the most challenging uh, diagnosis to make, whether someone's admitted to ICU with a pneumonia or a brain injury. I think my grandmother could spot there was a difference between them. But much more difficult is perhaps diagnosing VAP. Is that change on the X-ray actually new pneumonia? And so this is what we tried to do by studying the patients who were then came in without a pneumonia and looking at them as they did develop their VAP. We're pretty sure that they did. And you can see small numbers, but again, we were able to construct models that show they did have different metabolic uh, uh, profiles. So early work, but I think it's showing if we build on this, this is maybe we can have other diagnostics around to help us uh, differentiate, diagnose, manage our patients. But to make this a reality, we're going to need new diagnostics. These, all the things I've shown you so far have been batched, collected, stored, and then uh, assayed on research tools looking at whole genomes and so on. Can we do this that really would affect patient care? Well, I think we can, and we're just on the point of having the technologies available. This is a company that spun out of Imperial College that I've been working with, uh, DNA Electronics, who can now do gene sequencing on little chips, as you see, no bigger than your thumb, using clever engineering pH sensing semiconductor systems. Uh, Chris Tumas, who's the uh, Regis Professor of uh, Engineering at Imperial, who's managed to do this. And they can now sequence DNA, and they're focusing their first diagnostic around bacterial DNA sequencing. In the blood tube, you put it in this cassette, and two to three hours later, we will get sequences of our bacteria, maybe know about their resistance genes and so on. This can be easily changed to measure human DNA. In fact, it would actually be a lot easier. There's a lot more human DNA available in the blood sample. The real problem at the moment is picking up the bacterial DNA, but there's plenty of human DNA there. So they could measure our DNA or even our RNA on similar techniques. There are other companies available. This is by Marius Field Murray, again, detecting pathogens and it's already got regulatory approval, and maybe in a lab near where you are. And again, this can be switched fairly easily to start measuring human RNA, and this will be available within a few hours, and it already may be in the lab uh, in your hospital. So I think we are nearly there. But I think it's, going back to my initial comment, it's more than just risk stratifying. Um, we've done risk stratifying before. This is an old study, the TNF studies, where we said, well, we know we don't, no, we don't want to give it to everybody. Let's just give it to the high-risk patients, which we defined in that study as those who were IL-6 positive on a fairly simple uh, dipstick test. And sure enough, it was predicted the patients with the worst outcome, but they still didn't respond to the anti-TNF therapy. So I think we need to personalize our care. And as people are talking about giving immune uh, stimulation therapy, this recent study looking at IL-7 uh, from Richard Hotchkiss group, maybe the SRS um, phenotypes or other phenotypes may be the group we would want to treat. But there were clearly a number of challenges. Um, if we're looking at subgroups of patients, we're going to need large sample sizes to have the adequate power um, to really understand these findings. 
But I don't think it's just about having big numbers. I think it's the external validation, actually, that is more important. Are we seeing a consistent signal from uh, different groups, which we've hopefully shown with our discovery and validation cohorts? But it is happening. And actually, this is why I think we're really seeing it. It's other groups are seeing the same thing. So this is the Mars Consortium, Tom van der Poel and colleagues. And they published uh, last year gene expression profiles. They selected four different uh, profiles. Maybe they actually, by the end of it, I thought they'd probably found three. But they were finding one with uh, a worse outcome. And again, it was the immune suppressed phenotype. There was a lot of concordance. Um, when they looked at what gene pathways were differentially expressed in the way they've clustered, taking a different approach, again, we were seeing this immune suppressed phenotype having the worst outcome. And this published in this month's Critical Care Medicine. Again, uh, Tim Sweeney's taking the groups that's published and again seeing these consistent signals, again suggesting maybe three clusters um, and that we're seeing reproducible in different cohorts around the world. But clearly this will need testing in trials, which is going to be the right modality to take forward, I don't know. Maybe we'll need biomarker-guided and adaptive designs. Learn as we're starting these new therapies. Try many biomarkers drop those that are not looking promising, take forward the most uh, promising markers in these adaptive designs. I also think we'll need to think about clinical acceptance. Um, I don't claim to understand all of the gene expression profiles myself. I work with uh, clever scientists who understand it. And will, what will clinicians want at the bedside? Will they want a test that gives them a gene expression output, tells them th things are high or low? Or should it just be this patient should get this treatment or not that treatment? I don't know. We'll have to work out how we give that information. And which modality are we going to use? I've tried to give an overview of all the different areas. My personal thought is that we probably need a combination. And probably, most importantly, we need to combine it with clinical information and with machine learning techniques, um, actually pick out those clinical signs and symptoms that may guide us uh, and combine that with the omics um, from our tissue samples. So I think that's where the, the future lies. And I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you.